The best part about having to attend my wife's office party was that I got to drive my Challenger completely open. The worst part was that the faster I drove, the quicker I would arrive. The event took place at the Corporate Lodge, which was accessible via a pleasant 20-mile route. There are no stop signs, no traffic lights, and no traffic. Just wide road, waiting for the Dodge to do her thing. That also meant no petrol stations or jiffy stores. Donna and I had been drifting apart after our daughters got married. I was hoping for the exact opposite, but it was not to be. Donna demanded that I join her to this gathering, despite my objections. Previously, she had gone alone. Donna was a drinker, but I wasn't. I did occasionally drink beer. She was also a social butterfly, which I am not. For the past year, I suspected she was having an affair. At this time, I didn't mind. I believe it was one of the reasons we were drifting apart. I was simply biding my time, hoping to get out of a terrible relationship. I sought a means to end the affair. I have to accept that I am most likely responsible for my wife's decision to seek better pastures. In some ways, I'm a strange kind of minimalism. I grew up in an extremely poor household. My siblings and I had significantly less than other children our age. That includes bicycles, toys, pets, sophisticated electrical equipment, and other similar items. It felt nearly like being Amish without the religion. I wasn't stupid, and I completely knew how the normal world worked, but I couldn't bring myself to accept it. I realized how crucial it was to keep out of debt. It was vital to pay your bills, and it would also be good to set aside money for retirement in order to live a comfortable, minimalist lifestyle. You don't have to be a zealot, but you must maintain self-control. By giving yourself some indulgences, you can appear normal to most people. My main indulgences were my marriage and family. It was quite difficult for me to locate a woman who I believed could endure my idiosyncrasies and accept my individuality. Donna came from a similar background as me and was used to living a thrifty lifestyle. She didn't love it like I did, but she could endure it. The longer we were married, the more she appeared to relax. I mean, she got less frugal and more average. I didn't like it, but I knew, especially after the girls were born, that we needed to appear normal. We purchased a tiny, functional home and began to dress more appropriately. Donna got her hair done on occasion and learned how to groom and apply cosmetics. As the girls grew older, we upgraded to two iPhones from the previous year. Donna began to work. It was a minimum wage office job. Transportation was necessary. So we bought her a tiny Honda Civic, exactly like I did. Her salary nearly covered her transportation expenditures, lunches, and new outfit needs. It was a wash, but I was content with it. My name is Will Smith. That is about the most popular name a man can have. I work as a parts puller for a local firm that manufactures industrial compressors. The job is quite repetitive, but I enjoy it. I was satisfied with both the position and the money. I was offered promotions on several occasions, but declined. I did not inform Donna. My second enjoyment was something I kept from my wife. I believed it would be sensible to save for our retirement. Every chance I got, I'd buy a one-ounce Krugerrand. I had over 30 in my basement safe and was just beginning my final indulgence. This was a 1970 Dodge Challenger. My older brother, John, was killed while working on an offshore oil rig. He left me as the Challenger in his will. I was able to keep it up on my own, but the insurance rates were prohibitively expensive. Donna had done well while working at Gilbert Industrial. She received regular raises and promotions within her first year. She talked a lot about her profession, but eventually it tapered off. She now rarely discusses work or the people she works with. I sensed something was wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint it. I was hoping to acquire a better understanding of what was happening tonight. The workplace gathering resembled a retreat. It was a weekend event. I felt out of place even having to attend it. I'd met all of her associates at some point, and none of them were really appealing to me. We off the freeway at Holbrook, and I was finally able to set the Challenger loose. She answered just as I expected. Donna was uncomfortable with the speed, but she remained silent. Yes, I exceeded the speed limit. No, I did not care. Bill, what's the hurry? We've got plenty of time to get there. Why don't you slow down a little? I'm not anxious to get there. You know I didn't want to go at all. I'm merely taking this time to clean out the engine. She needs to run every now and again. Please don't be a spoiler. This weekend is crucial to my job. Mrs. Simpson stated that you must be present as well. Marge Simpson was the wife of Glenn Robertson Simpson, 
the business president. It was old money and old business. Why? What do you mean? Why is it vital for me to attend this workplace event? I do not comprehend, Bill. It is critical that you fully grasp my new position in the organization so that you can provide me with the required support and backing to perform my duties. I still do not comprehend. I'm sure Mrs. Simpson will be able to explain it to you when we arrive. I have always backed you in the past. Why is it different now? My new position has a number of unique obligations. Marge suggested that you be introduced to them gradually so that you may completely grasp them. It may be tough for you to understand at first, but she told me that you will come around. By the time we arrived at the resort, my adrenaline was pumping. Donna's message was simple enough to grasp. It was going to be an intriguing weekend. When we arrived, Donna strolled into the lodge, leaving me to carry the baggage. I felt as though I was being put in my place. Hello, Mr. Smith. Nice wheels. What is it? A 70 or 71? It was Toby Wallace, the corporate officer lad turned gopher. Hello, Toby. How are you doing? It's a 70. Toby introduced me to his wife, Bonnie. They were seated outside on the front porch, but it appeared like everyone else was inside. I looked around the parking lot and estimated there were around 16 automobiles and one B-double truck at the end of the lot. We spent the next five minutes discussing the Challenger. What are you doing outdoors? Why aren't you and Bonnie inside with the others? Mr. Smith, this isn't our type of audience. We had planned to depart early, but Mrs. Simpson insisted that we stay. We arrived early today to help set things up. The caterers left approximately an hour ago. You'll have to explain yourself. What's happening? Something fishy, but I'm not sure exactly what. I don't want to offend you, but I believe it has to do with your wife. Are you staying for the whole weekend? No. That is why I have my pickup parked by the side, so I don't need to worry about getting out later. Every minute things became more fascinating. So I best get this stuff up to our room. Okay, let me know before you depart. Sure. Mr. Smith, take care. Do not do something silly. Fortunately, there were only two little carry-on luggage as I entered the lodge. Mrs. Simpson caught my attention, smiled, and waved. Donna was waiting at the top of the stairs for me, looking irritated that it took me so long to get in. It is about time. Bill, we have a few hours to prepare for the evening, clean up, and dress appropriately. It's going to be a memorable night, and I want everything to be perfect. If it's okay with you, I'm going to take a walk around the property to relax. I will be back in plenty of time. As I walked out of the room, I felt myself smirking slightly. There was a small chill, which made my stroll more enjoyable since I guessed there were 16 cars. They were largely Mercedes, with a few Jaguars and a Lexus among the vehicles with out-of-state registration plates. I was a little perplexed as to how a woman in my wife's position could blend in among people of that class. She, or should I say, we were clearly out of our class. Something wasn't right. I noticed Toby and Bonnie loading their things into the truck. I waved and headed over to talk briefly. I see Mrs. Simpson has agreed to let you leave. Not really. We're sort of sneaking out. Mr. Smith, I'm uncomfortable here. Toby suggested that we stay, but I persuaded him out of it. Bonnie was quick to add. Could you do me a favor and stay until after the evening buffet? I'm also worried and I'd appreciate it. I am not sure what is going on, but I do not like it. Great minds think similar. Is that correct, Bonnie? She blushed slightly at my feeble, amusing attempt. I believe we can. There were crabs and oysters in the serving line. I thought I was going to like Toby. I did dress up, as my wife requested, before we went to the buffet. Our hostess took my arm and guided me to a secluded corner. We are delighted that you have chosen to attend tonight to support Donna. This is a significant step in her career, and she deserves your complete support. I am confident that you will be pleased with the large rise in income and benefits. Excuse me for asking, but what is the viewpoint that we are discussing? Donna was evasive when I questioned her about it. She typically just ignores me and tells me to wait till tonight. There's nothing to worry about, William. I believe she just wants to surprise you. You did not address my query. There is no formal title. I guess you could simply call her a personal assistant, I see. Well, the buffet looks nice. Thank you for your explanation, Mrs. Simpson. March. Kindly call me March. I spent the next hour or so trying everything on the line. Donna was busy chatting with prominent people, so Toby, Bonnie, and I got to spend some more time together. 
Mrs. Simpson arrived just as we were winding things up. William, Donna mentioned that you brought your sporty small automobile with you tonight. I was wondering if you'd mind doing a little booze run for us. I gave a smile and nodded. The ABC store in Holbrook carries three cases of wine. They are already paid for. So all you need to do is drive down and pick them up. There should be no complications. But if there are, please phone me. Make sure your phone is with you. I would be happy to march. I'll notify Donna and go to my destination. As she went away, I looked over at Toby. Meet me outside in five minutes. Donna only smiled when I told her Mrs. Simpson had asked me to help. Her only comment was, don't forget your phone. It's interesting that they emphasize the same idea. Toby, I need a favor. He smiled as I threw the keys to the Challenger. Are you serious? Drive down to Holbrook and pick up three cases of wine for Mrs. Simpson from the ABC store. I have a hunch there might be a problem that will cause a delay, if you get what I mean. Toby smiled and nodded. Here's my phone. Just put it on the dashboard. If it rings, do not answer it. Whatever you do, do not turn it off. Any questions? How long do you want us to be away? At least two hours. Also, fill up your petrol tank before returning to the resort. Enjoy. It was a little cool outside, but I had the foresight to wear a comfy jacket. Now all I had to do was wait and see. From various positions on the back porch, one could see the majority of the lodge's interior. A thermos of coffee would have been good, but I didn't plan ahead. I found a comfy location where I could see in without being noticed. Donna appeared to be the focus of attention. I was still not sure why, but I had a good idea. She was grinning, laughing, and mingling like a movie star. About 20 minutes later, Mrs. Simpson and Donna examined Donna's cell phone with care. I knew exactly what they were doing by verifying my whereabouts. Thanks to Toby, I was now almost into Holbrook. They both grinned as Mrs. Simpson raised her hand and began to speak. Unfortunately, I couldn't understand what was being said, but everyone in the room appeared to be quietly appreciating what they heard. It almost seemed like a low-key applaud. Glenn Roberts and Simpson approached and grasped Donna's hand. They started up the main staircase and then halted. He raised his and her hands in the air as if in a victory salute, and they both laughed. I could hear them cheering as they approached the stairs. I still had about an hour and a half till the Challenger returned. I choose to take my time and enjoy myself. I always carry my trusty back pocket knife with me. It was a present from my daughters approximately a decade ago. It was fine steel with a keen edge. I looked over my target area and decided to start with the automobiles nearest to the resort. I took my time. There was no rush. I gently inserted each valve stem inside my jacket pocket. I didn't want to lose any, nor did I want to litter the Simpsons' driveway. There are 16 automobiles and 64 valve stems. I had about an hour to go. What to do and what for? The automobiles were locked. The remainder were all open. So I started with the nearest one to the lodge and removed the registration slips, somewhere along the visors, but the majority of them were in the glove boxes. I had no idea what I was going to do with them, but I figured they could come in handy later on. I still had a 30-minute wait till Toby returned. I determined that since I had access to the automobiles, the valve stems on the spare tires had to be removed. I also had access to the trucks. Twenty minutes later, I had ten additional valve stems— Two of the autos lacked spare tires. I realize it was small and juvenile, but it offered me some little relief. I'm not a fan of confrontation, so everything I did or planned would be low-key and covert. I didn't have any self-esteem issues, so I didn't feel the need to come across as manly or heroic. I'll let all of the alpha males take on that position. Twenty minutes later, the Challenger reappeared. Toby and Bonnie appeared to have liked the ride. He confirmed that, as expected, there was a wait at the ABC store which appeared to have been premeditated. There were no calls on my cell phone while they were away. I switched it off and removed the SIM card. They were anxious to get home. I believe Toby wished him a safe trip and strongly advised him to find another employment as soon as possible. I'm sure the cases of wine in the truck were fairly costly. It was a simple thing to fix. I just placed all three cases on the front porch of the lodge. I didn't want them to accuse me of stealing anything. The journey home was peaceful. There wasn't much in the house that mattered to me. A few personal documents, my laptop, and my errands. Original. 
I was going to burn down the house before I left, but that would have made Donna a martyr. I did not want to do it. I was on the road in under two hours. I did not feel compelled to leave the typical note or wedding ring. Let her work things out. I was in no hurry and had no goal in mind. I drove for two days. On Monday morning, I called into work and gave my notice. I ordered that my final payment be mailed to my folks' home in Carlisle. They were upset that I quit without giving notice. I apologized, but did not provide an explanation. Waffle House serves consistently superb breakfasts. On the way in, I picked up a local merchandiser's paper and discovered some useful information. Wanted an advertisement for a local grocery. They were searching for someone to stock shelves around 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. After breakfast, I visited the market. It was in an eclectic older part of Chattanooga. I spent the following hour driving around the neighborhood. There were many older craftsman cottages and a few mobile houses in the surrounding neighborhood. I may be content with a small trailer, but I was hoping for something bigger. Then I stumbled upon a sign advertising a garage apartment for rent. I hadn't inquired about the market job yet, but I did not want to miss out on the garage flat. The garage was not included, but when I offered an additional $1.50 per month in rent, they accepted. It was a modest one-bedroom unit with a half-bathroom. It was sort of equipped. Bed, dresser, table, and chairs. The rent and location were both appropriate, so I took everything. Later, I discovered the problem with the bath. At least I had a place for the challenger. The supermarket situation was slightly different. They had a lot of applications, but not so many that they felt safe leaving alone in the store at night. I was straightforward in explaining my issue to the owner. What sealed the deal for me was when I volunteered to work under the table with no benefits and for a dollar less than they wanted to pay. They never asked for my social security number. I was thrilled, and they were too. It was a ten-minute walk from our apartment. I spent the remainder of the day settling into my new house. The landlord provided me the access code for his internet, which I thought was kind. After a brief stop at the local Goodwill, I had some kitchen supplies and a little microwave. I also received some sheets and cleaning supplies. That night, I terminated my life insurance policy. I opted not to deal with my bank or credit cards. What could she possibly hurt? Both of our daughters were now married. That made my departure a little easier. There are no grandchildren yet, but I am confident that this will change soon. I called my daughter Laura to let her know I was okay. I asked her to be ready to assist her mother if needed. Laura was aware that I had left, but Donna had provided no other information. She vowed to keep her sister Linda updated. I deleted all of my wife's calls and turned it off again. I needed a shower, perhaps tomorrow. Not everything was ideal. I needed to find a secure place for my gold. I recognized that what I had wasn't regarded significant. But that was significant to me. For whatever unknown reason, I ended up with a safety deposit box in Huntsville, Alabama. I hoped they couldn't connect it to me in Chattanooga. Of course, I was utterly wrong, but I felt like I gave it my best shot. It was an almost two-hour drive, but I didn't mind. The garage door at the unit was fairly secure, but I installed a new house and a heavy-duty lock to ensure that I could secure my daughter. It didn't take long for me to settle into my new job. They had a man work with me for the first three nights, after which they left me alone. I had no responsibilities in either the produce or meat departments. The frozen food department proved to be the most problematic. After the first two weeks, I had everything under control for a $1.20 down payment and $1.10 per month. I got a Planet Fitness membership, which fixed my shower issue. The main disadvantage was that I had to give them my credit card number. I had to make another journey to Huntsville to get a credit card from my new bank. I was beginning to realize how difficult it was to go entirely off the grid. Some adjustments were going to be required. I had no idea how hard Donna would look for me, or whether she would try everything. To hell with it. I will deal with that issue as soon as it arises. I had the routine down pat. I started work at 10 p.m. and finished at 6. It was a 20-minute jog or 30-minute stroll to Planet Fitness. I joined mostly for the shower facilities, but eventually began to use the other gym equipment. By the end of the first month, I was averaging over two hours of gym time every day. I felt better and was losing a little weight. I never considered myself to be overweight, but I was somewhat flabby. It was good to settle back into a routine. My new job suited me well, and I enjoyed it. It was repetitive, but also unique. It's difficult to describe, but I'm confident you'll understand. I finished my task, and they left me alone. 
The gym also provided an excellent assortment in a timely manner. I'd decided which exercises I liked and which I avoided. I learned that I didn't appreciate exercising with large weights because I had to sprint to my gym every day. I had no interest in the treadmills. I began each day with the Planet Fitness Circuit workout, which lasted about 30 minutes. I then did 20 minutes on the C2 rowing machine, 20 minutes on the stair stepper, and 20 minutes on an upright bike. I never got a television, but I did get a used desktop computer with a good-sized display. My everyday enjoyment consisted mainly of YouTube videos. I did not cook much, but I did notice that my eating habits changed little. Although it was not my plan, I found myself gravitating toward a keto diet when combined with my irregular working hours. I realized I was also fasting. After three months, I felt better and lost weight. It was time to contact my daughters again. This time I contacted Linda. Hello, Linda. It's your father. Well, it's time. We were all anxious for you. Are you okay? Yes, I'm great. Do not worry about me. I've always been able to take care of myself. I'm phoning to make sure your mother is doing well. Mom is doing wonderfully. It appears that she received a raise at work and enjoys her job. She is, however, really angry with you. She said that you abandoned her during her promotion party and then fled home like a devastated little boy. These are the words she used. She claimed you were jealous of her accomplishment. I'm sorry, but I can't add anything to that until she's ready to reveal the truth. That's all I got. She stated that without your salary, things are a little tight, but with her rise, she can handle it fine. I'm happy for her. Has she told you anything about her new job? Simply put, she earns more money and has more opportunities to travel. I did not reply. Linda resumed her activities after a little respite. Will you be home for Christmas? I do not think so. I will attempt to send something for you and Lara. We don't need or desire anything, Father. We'd rather have you here. Sorry for that. I have to go see Laura right now. I said, Hello. Bye. I felt a little down. I got the impression that my daughters didn't grasp the issue and thought I was the source of all the troubles. I was upset about that, but I didn't feel required to explain myself. My wife showed no remorse. My daughter's words made me feel a little bitter. Donna was doing really well without me. I still didn't understand why she needed me at home. I completed my case of black and tan and spent the weekend depressed. My beer consumption had steadily increased over the previous weeks. Things seemed to be improving beautifully. I was performing well at work and received an unexpected raise. They gave me complete control over my responsibilities, and I was able to streamline and optimize the stock replenishment system in a very short period of time. I produced a weekly report, which they used to determine inventory levels and restocking intervals. The store's overall computer system was already doing this, but they appeared to value the manual input. My living conditions were great for my needs and within my budget. My weight was down, and I was gaining muscle under the correct lighting. I could see a six-pack. I stopped shaving and now have a full head of hair that is just long enough to form a short ponytail. My entire image seemed to have transformed, and I appeared a little terrifying. My gym workouts were growing easier and longer. As an unanticipated side effect, I was making a few friends at the gym. They were not truly buddies, but rather acquaintances. I was very cautious around the female gym rats, since I did not want any inappropriate interactions with the guys. It did not matter. In fact, we frequently made fun of one other. However, there was one extremely unique union that emerged. Everyone referred to her as Harry. She wasn't very pleasant and hardly spoke to anyone. I turned out to be an exception. She was there every morning and worked for at least two hours straight. It was a challenging workout, not a flowery yoga practice. I would suppose she was in her mid-forties or so, and she had always been hard-looking. Sweatpants and sweater, all the other females were flaunting their bodies in tight latex and tiny clothes, not hairy. I received a lot of ribbing because I was the only male in the cage she spoke to or even glanced at. I did not encourage her, but I also did not reject her in any manner. To be honest, I was little flattered. After several months, I had not contacted my daughters or my wife. I just couldn't make myself do it. I made numerous trips to Huntsville to expand my Krugerrand collection. Then things began to shift. Could I chat with you for a moment, William? This was hardly the usual conversation opener for Harry. She referred to me as William while the other guys used the name Bill. 
come to think of it. She had never truly addressed me by my name before. Sure, not an issue. Is there anything I can assist you with? Yes, there is. We both sat on a bench and became comfortable. I have a work event to attend on Friday evening and need an escort. I will take care of all expenses, and I only need you to join me. I see you don't drive, therefore I'll also supply transportation. If it is necessary, I will repay you. I hesitated, which she swiftly caught up on. I apologize. Did I do or say something incorrectly? Not at all. It's simply that I have some skeletons in the closet. If you can work around these, I'll be pleased to assist you. Okay, what are the problems? First of all, I am married. Oh, crap. You never mentioned a wife. That, I suppose, calls into question the entire transaction. Not at all. I just wanted to let you know up front. I have not seen or spoken with my wife in almost nine months. I'm not even sure whether I am still married. Have you ever filed for divorce or separation? No. Next. I have nothing proper to wear. There are no suit jackets, dress shirts, or ordinary shoes. I have no use for any of that items. Thus, I don't own anything. Not an issue. I can take care of it. This is why I'm asking a week ahead. I work nights, but I believe I can get the evening off without a problem. I'm delighted you solved that one. She grinned when she said that. What more do you want me to shave or do? William, I like your beard and your hair, although you look a little scruffy. Would you mind if my stylist checked you out Friday afternoon? Stylist. She grinned and I moaned and said that it was fine. So began my connection with Harry, formerly known as Harriet Parker. Tuesday is attorney's day. I ended up at a bank. It wasn't a fancy place, but it was a step up from any place I'd ever been to. Harry had planned for my visit ahead of time. I wound up with two sets of jeans and two sport coats. They finished it up with a few shirts and ties. I pushed myself a little by adding two turtleneck tops to the pile. I've always liked them and thought they'd go well with sport coats. Harry had prepared everything on his way home. I purchased a new pair of decent shoes and some underpants. I needed the new undies due of my recent weight decrease. The shoes were moccasin style, but very stylish. My visit to the stylist went nicely on Friday. The guy that was taking care of me was easy to get along with and performed a fantastic job. He left me with a close, nicely trimmed beard and turned my ponytail into a sort of short, modified mullet. I don't know the precise phrase, but it was lengthy in the back. He promised me that it would be a lot easier to maintain. I enjoyed it. He didn't talk much about Harry, but did mention that I was a lucky fellow. Harry came up at the apartment at six on the dot. She did not get out of the car, but did a little beep. The Lexus appeared out of place in my neighborhood. I went with the gray blazer and gray turtleneck. I thought that I looked very fine, but I have no point of reference. I was pleased that she was driving because I did not know my way about the city. Harry, before we go in, can you explain what exactly I am supposed to do or not do tonight? The first hour or so will probably be socializing. You don't have to become engaged with any of that. Most of the individuals here will be big-feeling snobs that you don't want to have anything to do with. Avoid them if you can. Mainly, I want you to stay close to me and keep the leeches away. Try not to be obvious, but don't let any of them elbow you out. See that? I have a drink in my hand at all times. Ginger ale or mineral water. Be friendly and accommodating. And whatever you do, don't lose your calm. Basically, you are arm candy. Make them think that we are a couple. I never thought of myself as that kind of a guy. I don't have a lot of experience doing things like that. Are you going to be able to handle it? You bet. Oh, is there any food? After about an hour, we will each get a dollar five hundred plate of rubber chicken and listen to some speeches. When that is over, there will more glad handing. Oh, by the way, you look good. It was at that point that I realized that I had not complimented her on her dress or her hair. I really was out of my element. The first part of the evening when, exactly as she had explained, I found my role to be a bit easier than I had anticipated. The room was full of unattached males, all of them with expensive suits and big watches. Harry did look good, and most of them knew that she was not married. Quite a few of them took the time to stop by and chatter up a bit. They were testing the waters, so to speak. I found myself giving them all a squinty stare like Charles Bronson. Amazingly, it worked every time I left her side to refresh her drink. Another vulture swooped in. A few of them brought her drinks, which she quietly handed off to me to dispose of. Harry glanced at me a couple of times and sort of smiled. Sort of. At last, we got to sit down. 
Three hundred chicken dinners appeared from nowhere. It was a pathetic plate of food. I am not what you would call a fussy eater, but this was different. I kept thinking about the five hundred dollars. Harry sort of leaned over to me. William, do you want to blow this place? She tried to use a Bogart accent, but it didn't work. I didn't answer her. I just stood up, took her hand, and we quietly left. I don't think anyone even noticed when we hit the parking garage. She kicked off her shoes and threw me the Lexus keys. Find us some real food, William. Twenty minutes later, we were at Hillbilly Willie's. We each had a full rack and a long neck. She was no stranger to the Tabasco. Both of us ignored the side of fries. The bibs were eagerly welcomed while we were eating. I noticed one unusual thing. Her evening gown had long sleeves. Most of the women's gowns all had short sleeves or none at all. She was also still barefoot, and it didn't seem to bother her at all. Things quickly got back to normal. My evening with Harry was enjoyable, even though it didn't end up with any intimacy. We continued with our normal gym relationship. Three weeks later, Harry had another function that required an escort. I accepted, of course. I felt obligated to explain the situation to my boss, and he found it to be quite amusing under the circumstances. He told me that it would not be necessary to ask permission for time off. Just leave him a note. He more or less told me that I was responsible for my own time and to handle it accordingly. Harry's daily gym workout was pretty heavy. She kept her heart rate up and she sweated quite a bit. She was always fully clothed. Most of the female gym rats wear sports bras and shorts. Harry wore sweatshirts and long pants. It didn't seem to make sense, but I was not going to bring it up. Our second night out was similar to the first, except that there was no food and there was more drinking. More drinking meant more lizards sniffing around. Every other guy who approached her brought a fresh drink. I was busy most of the evening collecting and disposing of the unwanted glasses. One of the more obnoxious guys finally got my goat. I took him aside and quietly told him that if he hit on my fiancé one more time, I was going to clean his clock. He disappeared for the rest of the evening, so did a lot of the other sleaze. I didn't realize that I had become so menacing. We went for sushi after the gathering, but ended up eating $1.40 worth of sashimi. It was another fun, platonic evening. Two days later, Harry surprised me while I was doing my rowing. Why didn't you tell me we were engaged? I was a bit embarrassed yesterday when some of my workmates asked me about it. She didn't wait for an answer, but she did smile. I called Laura. She said that Donna had been avoiding her and Linda. All I knew was that Donna was traveling a lot, and that people were staying over at the house on a regular occasion. I asked her if her mother had filed for divorce and she had no idea. It had been several weeks since she or Linda had had any contact. For some reason, I was pissed off. The more bottles I emptied, the worse it got. The next morning, I got one of the flat-rate boxes at the post office and mailed 74 valve stims to Glenn Simpson at Gilbert Industries. I included a short note. Thanks for a fun evening. It had been well over a year since the party, but I was pretty sure that he would remember it. I missed the gym that day. I didn't want to work out with a hangover. I didn't get the third degree from Harry the next day. I promised to explain everything to her the next time we had supper together. She picked me up at six that night. Harry took me to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. It was my first time in a place like that. I did dress up nice for her. She listened quietly and passed no judgment the entire night. I was back at my apartment in time for my work shift. Harry had one more question for me the next day at the gym. Did I know any of the people who were at the lodge that night? When I told her that I had the names and addresses of everyone that was there, her eyes lit up. After our workout, she stopped by the apartment and I gave her an envelope with 12 car registrations. She grabbed them and kissed me on the cheek. There are 15 kinds of lawyers. Harry was a personal injury lawyer. She tried to explain it to me, but I just smiled and asked her what this was going to cost me. All I got for an answer was another kiss on the cheek. Three days later, I got a call from my daughter, Linda. Donna had called her to see if she knew where I was. Some sort of a problem had cropped up at Donna's workplace, and she was in the middle of it. She was not happy and needed to talk to me immediately. Linda refused to tell her anything. I wonder if Glenn got those valve stems. I called Harry and told her that I would be picking her up in 20 minutes. Her office was in an upscale strip mall. It was nice, but not too flashy. Harry had never seen the Challenger. The subject of my car ownership never came up before. 
The sound of the engine preceded my arrival and resulted in several curious onlookers from her office as she walked out to the car. I came around to open the door for her and smiled at all of the gawkers. Harry was laughing when she got in the car. Well played, William. Well played. I guess you will want an engagement ring now. In good time. Don't rush it. I kept the Challenger under control until we crossed the Tennessee River. Then I started to let her open up a bit. Route 72. Going into Huntsville is a nice stretch of road, but not the best place to show off. We were seated at Dreamland within two hours. William. All of the people that were at the lodge that night were served today. What do you mean, served? It is a lawsuit. The actual term is malicious conduct contributing to the deterioration of a marriage. There's really such a thing. It appears that all of the required categories have been met. Their conduct was intentional. It was extreme, and it caused you severe emotional distress. Since we had only sued for $100,000, they were advised by their insurance companies to just go ahead and pay it and avoid any public litigation. It was covered by their insurance, so it was no great personal loss to them. You mean we might get some money out of this? William, I already got three checks. There might be more coming. Do you think this might have something to do with Donna getting fired? I'm pretty sure that it was. Is this going to screw up my divorce? Did you file yet? No, not yet. I was going to ask you to help me with it. Harry had a really big smile on her face. William, pack a small bag and get the Challenger ready. We're going to take a road trip to see your wife. We will leave Thursday morning early. Now I was smiling. We left at 6 a.m. and checked into the Sheraton ten hours later. The Challenger was happy. I called Linda and asked her to bring Donna and Laura to lunch at the Reading Motor in the next day. The conversation at supper was a bit awkward. Picking and choosing off the Red Lobster menu was fun, and we ended up spending more money than we anticipated. We didn't care because it was a celebration of sorts. Our conversation was varied and convoluted. Why? We were both cautious about avoiding the elephant in the room. We were spending our first night together. We were friends without benefits for over a year. The last thing I wanted to do was make her feel uncomfortable. Well, I won't get into the details of the evening. I will say that it was not nearly as traumatic as we anticipated. We were both a little bit rusty, but managed to get through it with the expected results. She seemed relieved that I was not repulsed, and I was happy that it was not near as bad as she led me to believe. We were a couple of happy fools. We had a late breakfast in the morning. Donna and the girls were waiting at the table when we arrived. I wore one of my new sports coats with a dark turtleneck. I looked good. Harry wore one of her lighter business suits, sort of casual, professional. My wife and my daughters looked at me in amazement. Donna, Linda, Laura, this is Harriet Parker, my confidant and attorney. Harriet, my wife Donna, and daughters Linda and Laura. It was awkward, but the best I could do. Before we could get to any meaningless chit-chat, the waiter showed up to take the drink orders. I am not hungry. If you don't mind, I'll just have coffee. Donna was first to break the silence. I quickly glanced around the table and came to the same conclusion. Why don't you just bring us five coffees and leave a pot on the table? The waiter nodded and everyone seemed relieved at the decision. It is nice to see you again, Bill. Would you care to bring us up to date on what you have been doing the last few years? Donna had a slight smirk when she said it. Just working and allowing you the freedom to find yourself or whatever you were doing. Harry slightly kicked me under the table. I needed you and you deserted me. You might have needed somebody, but it wasn't me. Mom and Dad, quit it. I'm sure you didn't set up this meeting so that you could sit and snipe at each other. Dad, what are we here for? Linda was being very assertive. I could see that this was going to be a very short gathering. I was at a loss. I glanced over to Harry for a hint of some kind as to how to go forward. She ignored me but took over the conversation. Harry reached in her purse and pulled out an envelope. She handed it across the table to Donna. Mrs. Smith, this is a divorce petition. I think that you will find it very fair. I suggest that you take it to your attorney and have him look it over. Laura and Linda both looked astonished. It was easy to see that they were not expecting this. Donna, however, had a big grin on her face. She didn't take the envelope from Harry, but reached under the table and got a similar one from her purse. You stupid jerk. I divorced you eight months ago for desertion. You never got a copy because I didn't know where to send it. It is final. Whatever you got here is worthless. 
There is nothing that you have that I want anyhow. Her smile turned into a big smirk. The waiter returned with her coffee and a full urn for the table, just as Donna was getting up. She smiled at Harry and me and gave the girls a weird look before leaving. She left both envelopes on the table. Dad, can we all stay for lunch? I hear that they have a really good quiche here, Lara said. Harry and I had a small laugh and asked the waiter for menus. Harry, Lara, and Linda had a great lunch and conversation. I felt as if I were eating alone. I never understood women very well. The girls exchanged phone numbers and agreed to keep in touch. After returning to my room, I began packing. William, I thought we were staying another night. We are, but not here. Hurry and pack. One hour and thirty minutes after that. We were in Elkton, Maryland. Harriet Parker changed her name to Harry Smith thirty minutes later. We stayed the night in Luray, Virginia. I wanted to go farther, but we didn't make it. We bought a house with a three-car garage. That is another story. The girls claimed Donna threw a fit when she found out. I received two million dollars from Gilbert Industries. Donna moved to Iowa. I'm not sure why, but I believe it has to do with the two million she missed. 